I've got an embarrassing uh, confession to make. It was uh, months, and I don't know, maybe years, before as a medical student and young physician, I entirely understood the differences between prediabetes, insulin resistance, and metabolic in, uh, syndrome. So, I, you know, if I do that for a living and I couldn't understand it, or it took me a while, if you don't understand it, then I think, uh, you know, there's plenty of good reason. So that's what we're gonna talk about. In fact, it's been interesting. Almost every time I mention insulin resistance or prediabetes, and I rarely mention metabolic syndrome, but it's like every time I mention one of those, it seems, I think, you know, I know that's confusing, and I really need to do a video clarifying it. Um, because there is a boatload of confusion in this area. So this, that's what this video is about. What's the difference between prediabetes, insulin resistance, and metabolic syndrome? Um, as you know, I've covered, uh, uh, covered dubious diagnosis by Charles Piller. Um, he's, that's just another example of how much confusion surrounds uh, the issue of insulin resistance. And um, let's dive in. It's really three types of definitions. They're definitions of really the same thing, the same basic process. One is the disease model prediabetes. So people know what diabetes is, for the most part. Uh, that part's simple compared to understanding what we're talking about in this video. Diabetes is where you can't metabolize sugar. But, um, so that's the disease model. The second one is a biochemical model. It's insulin resistance. Um, and it's a biochemical definition. It's describing what's going on biochemically. Your body is not responding effectively to insulin. The third is a syndrome. Now, what's a syndrome? It's basically a cluster of symptoms and things that doctors see. Sometimes they know what causes it. Sometimes they don't. So they just call it a syndrome. So <clears throat> let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, as you see on here, there are different ways of defining um, the transition from normal to prediabetes to diabetes. This is from the UK, so you see these fasting plasma glucose numbers at 5.5, uh, between 5.5 and 7.0 being prediabetes. Uh, the hemoglobin uh, numbers, the hemoglobin A1C numbers are uh, those are not fairly standard. There's a good bit of uh, variation between those. And the OGTT, which, um, which I look at, again, those are in uh, English or uh, metric numbers. So let's, uh, let's move on before we get too bogged down on that. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the first one. Remember we talked about, number one, disease model, prediabetes. Number two, biochemical model, insulin resistance. Number three, um, clinical, metabolic syndrome. So, number one, disease model, prediabetes. Here's the criteria for the definition, at least according to a couple of groups. So again, <clears throat> one thing that you see is that there is a progression from having totally perfect glucose metabolism to having frank, brittle diabetes. And guess what? There is every level in between. So that's why you tend to see all of this debate and argument and uh, discussion over, okay, where do, we, where do we split between diabetes and prediabetes? And where do we split between prediabetes and normal? And there are actually multiple ways of testing for it as well. You can look at fasting glucose, two-hour glucose and an OGTT, and hemoglobin A1C, as well as a few other things. And so on each of those, you have, um, you have some argument and debate about what the specific cut points are. And guess what? There's yet a third variable. Who are you talking to? The World Health Organization, the CDC, the American Diabetes Association, the International Expert Committee on Diabetes, or the AACE, um, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Because there's very significant variation in these definitions. As you see here, for example, ADA and IEC differ significantly on um, Hemoglobin A1C, the ADA goes down to 5.7. The IEC says, no, you don't have prediabetes until 
you have a hemoglobin A1C of 6.4. Well, if you talk to some other uh, folks, like uh, you read the book uh, by Jenny Rule, um, she says, you know, you've, you're getting damage anytime you're over five. And the reality is, if you look at research, you are getting damage. Uh, usually, if you have a hemoglobin A1C over five. So the question is, how much damage do you have to be taking before you, there's an acknowledgement that you've got a problem there? Hmm. So <clears throat> I realized that every one of these slides starts off answering a question and then it uh, creates a whole bunch of new ones. But you know what? That's life, isn't it? Um, why does every answer to a question create a whole, a whole bunch of new questions? So let's go back, uh, repeat and review real quick. Three types of definitions, disease model, prediabetes, biochemical model, insulin resistance, and uh, clinical model, metabolic syndrome. And we just covered the disease model for prediabetes. Now let's look at the biochemical model, insulin resistance. What is insulin resistance? I took this um, image out of uh, uh, a couple of things that I've been using, uh, a couple of articles. Um, that I've done some videos on recently, and it has to do with adiposity. What on earth is that? That's another big clinical term that just means fat. Adipose tissue is fat tissue. And we all know that being obese can cause problems with insulin resistance, right? Maybe that's one of the, and, and that many people think that the major cause of the current diabetes and prediabetes epidemic is due to fat. Well, um, it's not. Um, if you actually study the numbers, it could be age, and very well maybe age as much as fat. But pardon me, that was a, that was a medical uh, biochemical bunny hole. The whole point behind this, this uh, image right here, though, is to show biochemically we've got cells mostly the uh, liver and muscle cells that are active in this process. If the blood sugar gets too high, over 120, uh, there are activities that start happening biochemically. Insulin is released. There are receptors in the um, cell. This is the cell wall, and they're of either muscle or liver usually, and there's a receptor right there. When insulin is released, it touches that, in, that uh, insulin receptor, and that starts a whole new set of metabolic processes, which basically end up pulling that sugar out of the blood to decrease the blood sugar, and therefore create more safety for the human again. Um, these, uh, the rest of this, uh, this image is basically showing how uh, being overweight, having too much fat mass, causes release of uh, what we call adipokines, things that uh, cause inflammation, tissue necrosis factor, uh, interleukin-6, leptin. So those things increase, um, they, they have their own receptor in the cell wall. Uh, that receptor sets off a whole new set of problems which decrease the cell wall's receptor uh, sensitivity to insulin. So back, again, maybe a couple of bunny holes about insulin res uh, resistance associated with fat and associated with aging. But here's the bottom line. The biochemical model is something in our cell wall, a, an insulin receptor, becomes less responsive to insulin. That's what insulin resistance is, decreased insulin sensitivity. So again, quick review just to, uh, to clarify. Three models, disease model, prediabetes, biochemical model, insulin resistance, clinical model, metabolic syndrome. So we've covered the disease model with prediabetes, we've covered the biochemical model with insulin resistance, and now the medical model, syndrome. What does syndrome mean? Well, if you look it up in Mir uh, Merriam-Webster, it says syndrome is a gl group of symptoms and signs and symptoms that occur together and characterize a particular abnormality or condition. Why do we even go there, and what's, what's the purpose for that? Well, early on, docs, just like almost any other syndrome, uh, docs noticed this uh, cluster of activ diseases or cluster of symptoms, cluster of signs, 
they, they start to put together and then they start developing theories. Wonder what's causing all this? Well, that sounds again maybe simple enough until you start getting into, so how do you define metabolic syndrome? This, believe it or not, is the probably the most um, simple definition of metabolic uh, syndrome. Low HDL cholesterol, uh, visceral fat, insulin resistance. Uh-oh, defining it by the other term. Again, sorry about that, but that's reality. High blood pressure, high triglycerides. So even if you look at those four the, uh, outside of the insulin resistance, visceral uh, obesity, low uh, HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, and high blood pressure. Docs have been seeing that for a long time and suspecting insulin resistance. Uh, so they called it uh, metabolic syndrome. Here's another way of looking at it, another variation of that term, metabolic syndrome. And the variation on this term has to do with... Um, adiposity or how heavy you are. Um, many many uh, definitions of metabolic syndrome include excess fat around the waist. Um, not all of them. And some of them don't even include high blood pressure as you can see. So I'm one of these guys that would fit over here on the skinny guy, on the skinny model that I do have high blood pressure but I don't have excess fat around my waist. It's uh, I've been a 30 three most of my life and just recently as I dropped my carbs over the past couple of years I uh, got down to 32 so not a uh, not a lot of fat around there so again we're, we're in the clinical definitions what the doctors see the syndrome components and again as we're seeing it's not that simple well talking about not that simple then there are other definitions and I'm not going to get too deep into that. I'm going to leave that one alone. And I'm just going to make the point. Now you see why I don't use the term um, metabolic syndrome very much. To me, it's like way too much of a junkyard. And also, uh, after looking at these, I think you begin to understand why I go back to the biochemical model. Because the biochemical model is explaining that's what's happening going on inside your body. And if you know what's going on inside your body, you can have an impact. So uh, last two or three points about this. Now we've defined insulin resistance, prediabetes, um, metabolic syndrome. The next question is, well, who cares? Well, obviously the CDC cares. They say, look, there's 86, 86 million Americans out there now with this, a third of us. And they're also saying 90% of us don't know that. 90% of us that have it don't know it. So, but you know what? It's like our old friend Charles Piller said, the CDC is probably just a bunch of scaremongers, right? Um, no. I mean, again, if they are, I, uh, I'm a proud card-carrying scaremonger myself, along with the CDC, the ADA, and a whole bunch of other people. Why do we care? Because it causes plaque. It causes cardiovascular inflammation. It creates risk for heart attack and stroke. A th one third of retinopathy is present at the time of diagnosis of type two diabetes. So Charles Pillar, don't tell me that insulin resistance or prediabetes has no complications, unless you consider blindness not a complication. Now to clarify, Few, if any, I've never heard of someone having complete retinopathy to the extent that they already have blindness already by the time that they, have, they get a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. But to see that disease process and the impact on vision already happening is incontrovertible. It, I, in fact, I'll cover that in a, in a couple of slides. And um, I will uh, also go to another comment uh, when I've heard from Dale Bredesen doing some training uh, in his program, I said, you know, you don't cover prediabetes enough. And he said, why? And he, I said, well, half of, uh, half of Alzheimer's is called by, caused by prediabetes. And he looked at me funny and he said, no, we think maybe all of it. So this is the, the comment from the CDC where they're saying, prediabetes is serious. This is not something to ignore, like Charles Pillar would tell you.
It's a serious risk for heart, attack, heart disease and stroke. Well, when you consider the heart, heart uh, attack, heart disease is the number one killer, and stroke is the number one disabler, and number four or five killer, used to be number three, those two alone should be enough to convince you that prediabetes is serious. But as I mentioned before, um, a whole different group that hasn't been labeled as scaremongers yet by uh, Charles Piller and Science Magazine, um, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists would say, yep, a third of uh, people that, that, are, that uh, have retinopathy already have it by the time they've got a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So again, this is a very serious issue, um, and it is just rife with misunderstanding. I hope this video uh, helps clear up some of that misunderstanding. Uh, and if you've made it this far, again, thank you for your interest. If you hit the uh, like button, and for sure if you subscribe or share, the algorithm reads that as a strong message that humans think this is interesting and important information. And the algorithm can share it more than any of us humans. Um, <clears throat> speaking of uh, sharing, uh, the, one of the best ways of sharing is on social media. We've got active Facebook, Instagram, and uh, LinkedIn uh, activities going on right now. We've recently started up things in uh, Pinterest and uh, Twitter, so we'd love to see you there. Check us out. Finally, um, <clears throat> with over 500 videos, a lot of people are saying, I can't find this video or that video. Our new social media uh, manager, Kim Hermosa, is starting to work on ways to help with that. So join the community. Uh, you can click on the links below, and um, <clears throat> you can get a little bit better uh, access. Thank you again for your interest.